Uh, well, good morning. Um, my name is Amanda Jeffries. I'm a consultant gynaecologist uh, based in Bristol and also a fertility specialist. Um, and thank you to the organisers for the kind invitation to speak today. So I've been asked to speak about uh, fertility and starting a family after melanoma treatment. Okay. So in terms of what I'm going to be speaking about, uh, I thought it's useful to look at it in three ways. Firstly, what is the impact of the disease or the treatment on chances of conception? What impact might it have on future pregnancies? And what could be the impact of the pregnancy on the disease process itself? Now, why is this important? So this is data taken from Cancer Research UK. And although the majority uh, of uh, people with, diagnosed with melanoma are diagnosed outside of their reproductive years, there is still a significant proportion of men and women uh, diagnosed in their childbearing years. So if you can see here, um, diagnoses um, in about 1,000 uh, women under the age of 40 and slightly fewer men. So it is a, a real issue to consider. So starting with melanoma and future fertility. Now, when thinking about melanoma treatment, I have to declare here that I'm no expert in melanoma as a gynaecologist. Um, but looking at the NICE guidelines, um, it, it's clear that the mainstays of, mainstays of treatment, um, and I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong here, um, is excision, immunotherapy, chemotherapy, and in some individuals, radiotherapy. Now, excision, depending on the location, generally is not an issue for fertility. Immunotherapy is a relatively new treatment and there, therefore there's probably not the information to guide us. Um, I think there are studies underway to look at the impact of immunotherapy generally on fertility. But in fact, um, immunotherapy has in the past been used as part of fertility treatment. So our assumption is that it's unlikely to perhaps have an impact on fertility, although I don't think we can say with any certainty. But what we do know is that chemotherapy and radiotherapy can potentially have an impact on future fertility in men and women. So when starting uh, with women, um, we know that women uh, are born with a finite number of immature eggs, and this is um, known as kind of ovarian reserve. This is predetermined when uh, a woman is in her mother's womb uh, as an embryo, as a fetus. Um, and as a woman goes through her life, these egg reserves drop um, steadily um, until a point at which the egg reserves are almost exhausted and a woman goes through the menopause. Um, and you can see here, uh, these are um, microscopic images of uh, the ovary uh, at birth in a woman who's uh, 25 and in a woman who's 50, so at the age of the menopause. And you can see the little round circles um, are egg sacs or follicles, immature follicles, and you can see that there's a steady decline. Now, what differs from woman to woman is the absolute number of uh, eggs she's born with, or immature egg sacs, um, and the rate of that decline. And clearly, factors occurring in a woman's life can accelerate that rate of decline, including um, oncology treatments. Looking specifically at the impact of chemotherapy on the ovary, so we know that, um, I'm not sure if this pointer is going to work, um, we know that these are these, these sort of immature egg sacs that will eventually will grow on and produce an egg which a woman will ovulate each month. These are present from birth and as I said before there's a finite number of these. And we know that chemotherapy can have a direct impact on these um, immature egg sacs of which there's a finite number. Um, we know that also it can have an effect on the growing egg sacs which are grown and developed each month and eventually one of these egg sacs will mature fully um, and the woman will release that at ovulation. And also it can have a bit impact on the structure of the ovary, particularly affecting uh, damage, affecting blood vessels and, and therefore causing sort of structural damage. In terms of radiotherapy, uh, the effect here seems to be on these um, immature egg sacs um, with direct damage to these. So the potential impact of chemo and chemotherapy and radiotherapy on the ovarian reserve is that it can result 
in a steeper decline in the overall follicular or immature egg sac number um, and possibly an earlier men menopause with an earlier end to fertility. But there are a number of factors that are going to determine the likelihood of a woman uh, to uh, have their fertility affected uh, by the treatments um, on offer. And these factors um, include whereabouts she is on that, um, on that kind of scale, so what her follicular number is, um, or ovarian reserve. Also, age is going to be important, so the ovarian reserve is likely to be better in a younger woman uh, than a woman towards the end of her reproductive life. And also, what treatment is being planned. So we know that different types of chemotherapy um, and radiotherapy can have different impacts on uh, the, uh, the female reproductive organs and the ovaries. And also, the site of radiotherapy is going to be important as well. Now, my understanding is that, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the alkylate, alkylating agents that tend to be used uh, for chemothera chemotherapy in um, melanoma. Unfortunately, what we do know is that these alkylating agents are relatively high risk for causing ovarian damage. So I think this is a re very relevant uh, subject for, uh, for me melanoma. So I talked about assessing where a woman is on that scale um, or in terms of egg numbers, and there are two ways that we can assess this, and it's, it's an assessment of ovarian reserve that we're making. So the first is to do a hormonal blood test called an anti-malarian hormone. And this basically measures hormone production by the egg sacs that are being grown each month uh, with the end result of ovulation occurring. And this, uh, indirect, this kind of gives us a measure of the overall follicular pool because the, 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 the greater the follicular number, the greater the number of egg sacs that will be recruited each month and therefore the greater this hormonal level. An alternative way of looking at things is with a scan. Uh, so this is a, a transvaginal internal scan and these are ovaries and what we're looking at is again the number of these growing egg sacs or follicles and these are the black dots um, on, uh, uh, in the ovaries. And that again gives us a, an idea of the overall uh, follicular pool. So if we think that a particular woman is at risk of uh, her fertility being affected by treatment, um, or a premature menopause, then what are the fertility preservation options? Well, there are really three options currently. First is to freeze eggs. Uh, the second option, option is to freeze embryos. And the third, which is a relatively new option, is ovarian tissue cryopreservation or freezing. So starting with egg freeze, um, the way we do this, it's essentially an IVF process. So we're giving medications that mimic the hormones the brain is sending to the ovaries, um, to stimulate production of eggs and eggs in much greater numbers than a woman would produce um, in a, a normal cycle. Normally it's just one. We'd be looking to produce between six and 12 eggs. The medications are usually given for about two weeks until we're ready for the egg collection procedure. Normally we like to start these medications at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, so with a woman's period. But we appreciate that actually time is often of an, e often of an essence um, in these situations. And there is an option for starting at any point uh, during the menstrual cycle. The point at which we think we've got the right number of egg sacs of the right size will go in to collect the eggs. And this is done usually under sedation. It's an internal um, scan. It's a vaginal scan. And there's a fine needle on the end which goes through the top of the vagina into the ovaries, into these egg sacs, which are the black areas here. The fluid's drawn off, the fluid hopefully will contain the eggs, um, and the eggs are then frozen through a, a fast, fast threes, freeze process called vitrification. The problem with freezing eggs historically has been that eggs don't freeze terribly well. So this is uh, HFEA data. The HFEA is the Human Fert Fertilization and Embryology Authority who oversee all fertility treatments. And in 2014, they looked at all the egg freezing data up to 2013. And overall, 700 women had eggs thawed that had been frozen. But actually, if you look through at the pregnancies that resulted as a result of the eggs being thawed, you can see that the pregnancy rate was much less than 10%, so not particularly good. 
there's been newer data to suggest that actually the egg freeze uh, results might now be better than they were historically. So this is actually looking at um, egg donation cycles, so a slightly different uh, scenario. Um, but what you can see is that actually using fresh eggs um, compared to frozen eggs, the um, pregnancy rates were a little bit low, lower with uh, frozen eggs, the live birth rates, but still relatively comparable and quite good success rates. And I think this reflects that actually the way we freeze eggs and embryos has changed and we are getting better success rates these days. The other option for a woman who is in a stable long-term relationship is to opt for an embryo freeze. And traditionally, embryos are frozen much better and we get better success rates with this. So you can see that actually live birth rate per cycle started um, is sort of, so this is per IVF stimulation round, um, is um, uh, for, for uh, the youngest cohort of women, so women under 35, is about 30% and fairly comparable to, um, to fresh cycles. And actually, I would say on the whole, these are fairly conservative estimates of success rates now, and they, they are even better than that. But a word of caution with embryo freezing. Um, what is important to be aware about with embryo freezing is that the embryos belong to the male and female partner and either of them can withdraw their, their consent to using these embryos at any time. And this is what happened to this poor woman. Um, it was quite a um, highly publicised case. Uh, she underwent a fertility preservation treatment, had fro uh, embryos frozen with her then partner. They subsequently uh, split up and unfortunately he withdrew his consent uh, to uh, her using the embryos and she couldn't use them. And he was well within his rights, unfortunately, in the eyes of the law to do that. So what are the risks uh, of egg and embryo freezing? Well, the first thing to say is it does delay treatment. You, as fertility specialists and fertility units were well aware of the time pressures on treatment, and usually, certainly in the fertility unit I work in, we will aim to see patients within a day or two of referral. Our aim would be that they would be within treatment if they wanted to within a few days of seeing us. Usually it's about a fortnight to the egg collection procedure um, and then you know, a few days to recover from that. So you're perhaps looking at a month's delay in treatment and whether that's an acceptable delay in treatment I think needs to be discussed with the dermatologists, oncologists and clinicians overseeing treatment. There is obviously a significant time and emotional investment in this process in what is um, an incredibly difficult time um, anyway. There have been uh, concerns as to whether the high hormone levels might accelerate the disease. Um, looking at the literature, there's been a suggestion in the past that melanoma might be hormonally driven. Although there have been no studies looking at um, disease process in women undergoing IVF treatment for fertility preservation, if you look at the data of women diagnosed in pregnancy or women on the pill, um, where hormone levels are similarly high, there doesn't seem to be an association with acceleration of the disease. So I think we can be relatively reassured by that data. And then the risk of, of, of the IVF treatment process itself. So we know that with ovarian stimulation, there is a risk of an over-response to the IVF medications and developing a condition called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, this is a condition where the high hormone levels cause shifts um, in fluid in the body and in a small proportion of women, so less than 1%, can make them quite unwell, uh, requiring hospital care and supportive treatment. Um, there are obviously risks of the egg collection as well, so it is an invasive procedure and there is a small risk of um, internal damage to organs and vessels, although it's done under scan, scan guidance and we would consider that an incredibly small risk. I mentioned ovarian tissue cryopreservation and this is a relatively new technique and it's where um, an ovary or a portion of the ovary is removed laparoscopically prior to treatment and frozen. And then there is the option of re-implanting re this uh, ovarian tissue back into the pelvis on the pelvic sidewall um, once treatment is, is completed. Now the benefits of this is that actually um, it restores natural kind of ovarian function. So you have some functioning ovarian tissue in women that might at 
otherwise become prematurely menopausal. And so we know that ovarian hormones have other benefits other than fertility in, kind of, in terms of bone um, and cardiac protection. So that's one benefit. There's also a chance of natural conception, um, although we know that the majority of women undergoing this treatment tend to conceive with an IVF process. It's also an option for prepubescent girls as well, so we can't stimulate the ovaries of girls before they've gone through puberty. We just wouldn't get a response. Um, but this is an option for, for younger girls, uh, young girls undergoing cancer treatment um, to preserve their fertility in the future. And I think given that it is a, a, a one procedure um, and a procedure that is relatively quick to recover from, there's perhaps less potential for delay in treatment than with egg or embryo freezing. Unfortunately, at present, um, it's not NHS funded. I think that will change in the future. Currently, it's charitably funded. Um, and it's still relatively experimental. So worldwide, there have been about 50 live births. Um, but, but that's continuing to grow all the time. Um, the uh, charity here that provides um, this treatment is actually Oxford-based, so not based too far away. And it's Future Fertility Trust um, who provide uh, this particular treatment. Not forgetting the men, um, we know that chemotherapy can have an effect on sperm production. And the potential effect really depends on where um, in the sperm production process the effect is, is, is happening. Unlike women, men can actually go on producing sperm throughout their, their lives. Um, and the sperm actually arise from these stem cells here. And then the, the sperm cells are, are, are produced and they mature um, into the mature sperm. So if you've got damaging happening here to the stem cells, so the originator of the, the sperm, then that's likely to uh, result in a permanent absence of sperm or azoospermia and therefore a permanent loss of fertility. If the damage is being done to the growing or developing cells, and these cells take about three months to develop, then it's likely to be a temporary or transient uh, loss in sperm production. Um, and, and after a few months, sperm production is likely to recover. <clears throat> um, and I, I think the, the, the kind of closest evidence we've got for the, the um, effect of the, the kind of treatments that men might receive uh, for melanoma um, and the effect that they might have on sperm count is, is a, a quite an old paper looking at the effect of uh, chlorambucil, which is an alkylating, alkylating agent on sperm count. Um, and this gentleman had uh, a, a course of chlorambucil within a three month break and then a further course and his sperm count and motility was looked at. And you can see towards the end of the treatment, there was quite a steep decline in sperm count, but then towards the end, so of the three month break, there was some recovery um, in sperm count. And obviously the degree um, of recovery is gonna depend on the drug and also the dose and duration uh, of the medication used. Fortunately for men, sperm actually freezes very well. Um, so the sperm sample can be produced prior to treatment and stored uh, for future treatment, either with IUI, which is an intrauterine insemination technique, or more advanced techniques um, such as IVF in vitro fertilization or ICSI treatment, which is an advanced form of IVF where the sperm is injected into the egg. Now, the treatment will really depend on the quality of the sperm, so the number, the motility, and the number of normal sperm. This probably hasn't projected up very... Uh, you probably aren't able to read that, but it's just really talking about the funding aspects. And um, obviously, it's going to vary from CCG to CCG. This is my local CCG's policy, and I would urge... Uh, sort of clinicians and patients to just be aware of what's, a, what's available out there. So in my CCG, they uh, will fund oncology treatments um, to, sorry, they will uh, fund fertility uh, preservation for men and women undergoing uh, oncology treatment. So they'll offer sperm collection and storage, uh, egg or embryo freezing. Um, and um, this is um, regardless of whether you're in a relationship or not. Um, normally, for fertility treatments, uh, couples have to meet certain um, criteria in terms of weight, smoking status, but for, for purposes of uh, fertility preservation, this isn't necessary. 
um, but there is an age limitation, so they won't treat uh, women uh, up to the age up to their 40th birthday or men over 55. But again, this will vary um, from CCG to CCG. Just a little bit on the legal aspect. So uh, sperm, and, uh, sperm, eggs and embryo can be stored for up to 55 years um, if uh, diagnosed as prematurely infertile, but it has to be reviewed every 10 years. It has to, has to be stored in an HFEA accredited center with the appropriate consents. And as I said, a partner can, uh, can withdraw consent at any time. So ultimately the choice for fertility preservation will depend on time scales the age of the patient, relationship status, the disease and the treatment being offered, the local funding, and most importantly, patient choice. But I would urge you to always consider it early, both clinicians and patients, because after treatment is often too late. Just a little bit now on two slides on, on pregnancy outcome after cancer treatment. Um, it's reassuring that actually, despite what I've said, many patients will conceive naturally. And the, the evidence suggests that naturally conceived pregnancies are probably no higher risk than in the general, general population. The exception to that is perhaps when women have uh, had radiotherapy to pelvic organs and that can affect the functioning of the uterus. There's some evidence there might be an increased risk of miscarriage for the first few months after chemotherapy, but longer term there doesn't seem to be that risk. And there's no increased risk of inherited abnormalities, the evidence suggests, after chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And what about um, the impact of preg pregnancy on melanoma? As I said before, there's a past suggestion that melanoma might be hormonally driven. I think there's not the evidence in the literature to support um, any increased risk of recurrence um, if pregnant during the diagnosis or shortly afterwards. And traditionally, the evidence has been, uh, the, the advice in the past has been to delay pregnancy for more than three years following the diagnosis. And I don't think the evidence would necessarily support that. But I think it's a conversation for patients to have with their clinicians regarding the timing of pregnancy. So in summary, patients and clinicians consider fertility preservation early. I think it's always a discussion that should be had with the patient and um, the, the decision is really a patient-centred one. And reassuringly, there doesn't appear to be any evidence of acceleration of the disease of worse, or worsening of prognosis uh, with pregnancy. Thank you very much.